Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to uh, allow me to speak first. That's good. Um, I'm going to talk about Postgres futures, but uh, I think what I got from that last presentation really was exactly how far uh, Postgres has come in the last 21 years that uh, Postgres has been uh, a public open source project, and obviously the years before that when it was uh, in the university being built. What I, what I thought was interesting about that last talk as well was to, to emphasize that there is this new generation of things that are, are coming up with surprising ideas. And actually, Postgres itself is one of those surprising ideas because Postgres has really come to maturity after the year 2000. So when people say uh, Postgres is your, your granddad's relational database, Absolutely not. We've really got to kind of challenge some of those perceptions that people like to uh, hang out there. Uh, one of the worst perceptions that I've seen is when people say Postgres is a relational database. And obviously the name and the whole design from the word go was a database that was more than just relational. And it's kind of really strange thing to be uh, sort of hung with that particular one. So what I'm going to do is really just uh, start off uh, by uh, saying that we're at Postgres 10. Uh, so, round of applause, please, for everybody that contributed to Postgres 10. The nice thing about this conference is it's really well timed for the uh, release of Postgres 10. It's almost out, so you really should be reading the docs now, looking at the late stage beta. Uh, it's almost with you. Uh, the major features list is going to look something like this. This is the provisional list. Strangely, we haven't yet fully agreed that, and uh, um, maybe that will be uh, done very soon. Um, so uh, Magnus is going to give us a talk about that. Uh, what I've got throughout this whole talk is uh, links to all of the different uh, talks that you will see at this conference. So have a look at uh, the, the bottom right of the slide so you can see which talks pick up on uh, the topics that I'm going to go through. So most of what I'm going to talk about is about uh, features in core Postgres. Um, we are seeing a huge uptick in submissions now. Uh, we, we're, we've, we've got projections that there's going to be more than a thousand patches into Postgres 11. Um, and uh, as a result, we're expecting uh, the number of features to go up again. Uh, and that uh, rate of delivery of features is really important for the project because it exceeds anything uh, commercial vendors are able to deliver, uh, which is a very important thing. Uh, so when it comes to comparisons with uh, commercial ways of doing things, they just can't compete because it isn't just something happening out of Berkeley uh, or something just happening in the US. It's a whole worldwide phenomena of people that are writing features, contributing to Postgres. And what you'll find is if you write a patch and submit it to the list, it will probably get a review before you wake up the next morning because there's people all around the world uh, looking at things. Um, there's, there's many active projects outside of core uh, and I'm going to be talking about one of those in a lightning talk uh, this evening as well. Um, but there's a lot of other projects uh, being discussed here uh, as well. So what I wanted to do now is just flick through uh, some of the highlights of what I see as future developments in uh, the open source PostgreSQL uh, project uh, and how we're going to get there. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been discussing is uh, what I call transaction-enabled functions. That's functions that have got a commit and a rollback in them. Uh, and that's a fairly uh, kind of obvious kind of thing. Uh, show of hands, who would like that feature? <laughs> fairly popular, good. Uh, and there's, a lo there's another load of transactional uh, changes that are under discussion as well. So the transaction-enabled functions would allow you to put a vacuum inside a function or a create uh, index concurrently, that kind of thing. So there's quite important basic functionality that 
we still want to add to Postgres. Um, logical replication uh, is uh, top of the major features list and uh, that comes with some new commands uh, that we've got inside Postgres, create publication and create subscription. So it's working to obviously what we call a publish and subscribe model. Uh, and we've got those as uh, DDL objects that you can dump and restore was one of the main uh, purposes of making it uh, in that form. So it's good, it's usable, uh, and Robert Tree will no doubt tell us all the good things uh, about it at uh, 4 p.m. on Friday, as well as some of the problems. Um, what I would say is that uh, we've got a roadmap of enhancements for some of those things over the next couple of releases, uh, and there are developments outside of core uh, of things that are particularly interesting. Uh, the logical decoding system you'll see is being used by uh, people to uh, send data to Kafka, uh, in some cases being used um, uh, as a way of administering Postgres better and such like. So there's lots of uses of this core technology coming through. Um, one of the things that I keep uh, being asked about is a blockchain and everybody seems to be uh, talking about blockchain and I, I don't really understand it myself because when you look at it, it's basically a multi-master database. And I kind of think, well, I'm sure we've got one of those somewhere. Um, the other thing about it is uh, they never ever vacuum, which uh, is a kind of, I think we could probably tell them that that's gonna end in disaster at some point in the next few years. Uh, so I don't know what the blockchain guys are gonna do, like vacuum every 100 years or something along those lines. I'm, I'm not really sure they haven't uh, explained uh, how that will work. But those concepts are quite interesting because it helps us to understand that we need to look at uh, provenance tracking in the database. Um, so yes, we have multi-master with Postgres BDR. Uh, we've been spending uh, a lot of time putting that into Postgres. Uh, at this point, we've we spent upwards of five years uh, putting pieces of that into Postgres. Um, and it looks now, having looked at the uh, feature roadmap, I, I did say before that we would submit that to Postgres 12, and we will, uh, but what I've recently come to realize is that the, uh, the actual number of features that uh, are gonna uh, still to come from the BDR project into core Postgres will take at least the next three releases to put in there. Uh, of sort of various kinds of infrastructure and things. Um, so, so just to say that the multi-master features will be submitted to Postgres 12, but there will also be things that um, run over into Postgres 13. Uh, Tom Kincaid's gonna talk about that uh, on Friday as well, or at least multi-master. Um, provenance, uh, the ability to look back at what happened uh, is particularly important and uh, that lends itself to historical query, which is already part of the SQL standard, and we should be moving eventually uh, in the direction of implementing this feature. Uh, and uh, there's a talk on that as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, where we are with the design and whether that would go into core, uh, but the whole uh, idea of historical query is something that's particularly interesting to users. It's one of the most frequently asked for features um, because it's, uh, there's, there's some Oracle feature that allows you to travel back in time and look at your data before you did delete without a where clause uh, and things like that. And <laughs> so for some reason, that's kind of important to people. Uh, to but uh, yeah, so, so eventually that's something that uh, we'll get. I've got some designs for that and some implementations and I know there's, uh, there's people already looking at that. Uh, partitioning, uh, we have uh, in Postgres 10, uh, declarative partitioning, it's on the major features list. Uh, there's a number of things it doesn't do yet, but I'm very pleased to say that I think all of the things on the it doesn't do list will be fixed in Postgres 11. At least that's what I'm seeing, uh, and I know that uh, we're gonna be able to uh, contribute to that as well. So I think there's probably gonna be about three companies involved in uh, submitting features in that particular area. Uh, obviously partitioning, 
uh, is important for business intelligence performance. And there's a whole raft of things that um, people have been working on. Um, it's not necessarily very clear, uh, but uh, the work required to have materialized view automatically uh, updated as the database changes is coming. It's just taking a little while to, to get there. Um, using foreign data wrappers for external data is already possible. So some of the things that we uh, talked about, accessing block storage, uh, is, uh, is likely to occur as well. Um, the Andres has got to talk about uh, increasing uh, executor efficiency and Postgres uh, general efficiency, which I uh, think will be a very good talk to attend. Uh, Corey's got some stuff about ETL, and Chad is also talking about the FDWs for external data. Uh, one of the things that uh, we uh, do get asked frequently is what Postgres is doing about large-scale clustering. And that is uh, one of the things we have is Postgres Excel, uh, but there are other alternatives. Uh, you'll see a talk by uh, Citus uh, here as well on that uh, particular subject. So uh, what I can say about uh, Postgres Excel is uh, there's a stable version uh, based on 9.5, but the uh, uh, Excel version based on Postgres 10 is already at alpha 2. Okay, so we're not very far behind the actual Postgres release process. Uh, so that is expected to go uh, production in tw early 2018. OLTP performance is uh, important as well. Um, there's a whole uh, raft of different changes there that are, that are interesting, uh, not least the fact that um, there's been a couple of benchmarks published that uh, commercial vendors uh, are saying that they've got twice the performance of Postgres. Uh, and if you look closely, it's uh, a very selected set of benchmarks that are showing quite high-end performance. Um, what I can say is we really just haven't done enough tuning on that. But what I would temper that with is to say Postgres over the last few years has become a hundred times faster than it had been in the past. So a factor of two on an isolated uh, use case is not something that I'm particularly bothered about and uh, something that we can easily make gains on. Um, there are discussions about uh, high volume, high performance, uh, high transaction rates uh, over the next couple of days as well. So there's some interesting talks to attend there. What I think is inevitable now is that uh, we introduce uh, pluggable storage. Um, hardware is evolving. Uh, there's, there's more types of hardware coming than we've ever had before, and we need to be able to respond to that. Um, the stonebreaker hypothesis that I call it is the idea that uh, holding your data in a particular form allows particular use cases to go faster. I can't really argue with that. His contention that that won't fit in Postgres is clearly wrong. Um, and we are able to support multiple use cases. And we'll probably do that even better with pluggable storage. Um, columnar storage is coming, uh, but I just a, a point to say that uh, specifically uh, just columnar storage is not enough. Uh, we already know that we need to do major changes to the executor uh, to get that to work effectively. So it's not just simply about changing the underlying storage and it all goes faster. There's some executor changes as well. But they're understood now after some years of attempting to do this, and I think we're, we're making reasonable progress uh, towards that goal in the next couple of years. So really wa watch this space uh, for, for how that's going to affect things. So what we're seeing now is massive adoption of PostgreSQL, uh, which is a truly amazing thing. Um, some years ago, I said that uh, Victory looks like Microsoft Postgres. And um, sorry to kind of pick on one particular company there, but I'm very pleased to uh, see uh, 
uh, that they are now a platinum sponsor of this very conference. So what other proof of uh, the victory of, of Postgres over other approaches? So where does that leave us then? Because obviously if that's happened, then like what next? Well, the whole world hasn't yet adopted Postgres, but clearly it will, or some derivative of Postgres, okay? That really kind of appears to be inevitable now when you look at the, the list of people that are uh, shipping databases. And the joke used to be something about, you know, if you, if you have a big database company, then you're, you're bound to buy a big yacht. But I think it's the other way around. It's if you're a big successful company, you just have to have your own version of Postgres these days. It's, uh, you know, you're just not, not able to be seen out in public without your own version. So... Uh, so this is, uh, uh, it's, it's become the kind of uh, plaything of rich men to, uh, to have your own version of Postgres. Um, anyway, so wh what is driving all of this? Um, you know, is, is Postgres going to get, uh, you know, sort of bypassed by commercial offerings? Well, I would say not, because the, the body of interest now that exists around the open source uh, model is, is very clear. And for different purposes as well, companies are buying significantly into the idea that open source is not a religion and uh, it isn't only something that people with long hair uh, do. Um, it's about avoiding vendor lock-in and it's about uh, enabling your business to adopt new approaches. For example, microservices wouldn't be possible if you had to pay uh, an instance license for every uh, time you set up a, a database. We've got customers that are running production systems, but one production system is using 100 instances of Postgres. And obviously, if they have to pay a license fee for each one, that be becomes ridiculous. So it, this is actually enabling new ways of doing things, which is, is particularly important. So in order for this to continue, uh, there are some things that we do need to do in order to maintain uh, the project as open source. Uh, obviously, uh, people need to continue to contribute to the project. And so uh, it's important that all the vendors involved in Postgres contribute to the project. Uh, now, the only way that we can encourage that contribution is if the users, uh, and that's you, so you are the buyers, you need to insist uh, that the companies that you work with contribute to open source. If you don't insist that, it won't happen, okay? Uh, so the question that you should ask your vendor uh, is, what did you do for Postgres, okay? And ask that question in detail, get a good, thorough answer and appreciation of what that means. Because that question drives the future of the open source project. Okay? If you don't ask it, it won't happen. It's much the same as uh, sort of um, food, um, uh, food health. If you don't ask about the quality of your food, you get given poor quality food. Uh, and the same is true with open source. So, uh, one minute left, and I'll spend that talking about my uh, company's second quadrant. Uh, we are a company that is majority owned by PostgreSQL committers and contributors. Uh, we're not venture capital funded. Uh, we are using the money that we get from working with user companies uh, to put that back into the open source Postgres project. We are not the only contributors and we're ecstatic about that. We see ourselves as catalysts to keep the project open in the longer term. So second quadrant is about sustainable open source development and we provide a range of services uh, for uh, your use of Postgres. So if you'd like to speak to us more, please come along to the booth. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.